We're there. Hebrews 11. Actually, I said that to my daughters. I'm like, man, we're in Hebrews 11 already. It's been great. What a wonderful study. So if we could, since you've gotten there now to Hebrews 11, if we could just pray one more time that God would attend the preaching of his word, give us spiritual vitality. That's what I'm praying for this morning for us. Father, give us, as we come to your word now, your spirit that illuminates the text, that illuminates our hearts, that brings out the meaning, and not just the meaning, but applies it and drives it into our hearts. There's no way that I or any person can specifically apply your word to every situation that's happening in the room, but you can, God, and I pray you would do that this morning, that you take the truth and you would make it personal for each one of us, God. And by doing that, I pray you would increase our faith, that we would have greater confidence in you, that we would rest ourselves more wholly on you, that we would turn quicker to you in in a repentance, that, Lord, you would would be all in all for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we ended chapter 10 last week with a charge to live by faith into the future, to preach your past preaching faith into your future, then to live by that faith into your future. We saw at the very end, if you want to just read up one verse above in the end of chapter 10, verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So faith is vital to the Christian walk. Faith is vital to the Christian life. In fact, just think about how many Bible verses you memorize if you were a church kid growing up on faith or, or think about the, the verses your kids maybe who are in children's ministry right now or you're teaching them through a program. The verses that they're learning on faith. Just consider a few of them. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. James 1, 3 and 4, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Then finally, Romans 1.17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's from Habakkuk 2, which was also in last week's passage picked up by the author of Hebrews. So we're 10 chapters into this amazing book, and we've all arrived at the same spot. And here it is. You either walk by faith in Christ, you either walk by faith in the perfect priest, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect law keeper, the perfect temple, you walk by faith in this Christ and are saved, or you shrink back from lack of faith in this Christ and you're destroyed. That's how serious faith is. That's the whole premise of this book. Thomas Schreiner says, faith is introduced here now in chapter 11, faith is introduced because the flip side of apostasy is faith. And I think we could say the flip side of faith is apostasy. There's no in between. And that's why, as we turn now to chapter 11, we're going to see the author spending an entire chapter, an entire chapter talking about, illustrating, exhorting, persuading us to faith in the Son of God, faith in Jesus Christ. If milk does the body good, faith does the soul good. But you ask, what is faith? What exactly is this thing we call faith? Is faith a feeling? Is faith like something that that you feel in your gut? Is it a happy-go-lucky disposition? What What does the author mean by faith? And, and in Hebrews, we're not going to get every possible tangent on what faith is, but we're going to get a solid definition to go by here as we begin in chapter 11, verse 1. Let's read the first three verses. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their, com- their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God 
so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith is a certainty of conviction. Faith is a certainty of belief. Other translations like the King James Version call this a substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. We think of a substance and we think substances are physical, right? It's a physical substance. But in the immaterial world, the essential substance of certainty is what we call faith. It's conviction. It's belief. Faith is confidence that what is true is true. That's what faith is. And this confidence we find is formed by revelation, it's formed by reason, and it's formed by experience. He gives a few of these here in the text. He gives an example of faith by revelation and faith by reason in verse 3. By faith, read again, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It says, we understand this by faith. How do we know this is true? How do you know this is true? You weren't there, right? The oldest person in this room or the oldest person that's watching this online was not there when God made creation. Nobody was there when God made creation except for God. Our knowledge of creation comes through the revelation of God to man, right? He tells us what he did. He tells us what happened. We begin the book, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, we're told... God created the heavens and the earth. How did Moses know this? God told him. And he reports his revelation. We find in the beginning that God speaks and creation springs up so that what is seen with your eyes, what's visible, is not made from things that are visible. So we reason that from this revelation. God creates them. God sustains them. Faith is not the opposite of reason. It's just not dependent on our ability to fully reason. We, we use both, though. From science, we can observe what we can see. We can see what was made. We can reason that the universe had a beginning. And people differ on their understandings of how that began and, and how we got here and all of that. But behind every scientific observation stands God, the revelation of God, the creator, who through his revelation and then through our reasoning, we can come to know what the truth is for what has been and we can come to know what the truth is for what will be. Psalm 33, 6 tells us he created by his word, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that he sustains it by his word. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. We must believe that by faith. And faith is the assurance, the conviction, or we could say the substance that holds this as true, even if we can't empirically prove it. What is true, we believe is true. And what we're going to see in this chapter is that having this kind of a conviction about the things that are true, God, his revelation, having a conviction about that changes the trajectory of your whole life, changes the course of your life, changes your path. And what we're going to enter into now is experience. He's going to show, show us the experience of faith by people of old People in the Old Testament who God worked through and, and, and worked faith through. And he's highlighting among these very regular, ordinary people who, if you read the whole story, most of them do a lot of sinful things. But there's some aspect to each person that contributes to our understanding of faith. And God commends them for their faith. And so we're going to consider five faith stories this morning to think about how it can strengthen you and strengthen me for our faith today. So look in verse 4. We're going to start with Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Let's consider Abel. He reaches back to the beginning of Genesis to chapter 4, to the first brothers, Cain and Abel. Maybe you know the story, maybe you don't. I'm not going to do this for every one of the stories, but for these first couple, I just want to read back on the Genesis text so that you can, you can see the context here. You can go there if you want, Genesis 4. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm just going to read it. 
Now here's what's happening with this Abel and with Cain. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So in Hebrews, when it says, though he died, not of natural causes, he's murdered by his brother. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Genesis 4, verses 2 through 10. Now, what we know about Cain and Abel is, is relatively little, but we know that they each brought an offering to God. Cain brought fruit or some kind of offering from the ground. Abel brought firstborn of his flock. And you, you notice that we weren't told specifically what the difference was between their offerings. We weren't told what, what made the difference between them, just that Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was rejected. But we know from Hebrews that the issue here from the very beginning was actually faith. Faith, by faith, it says, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice. What made it more acceptable? Was it that he offered his firstborn lamb, which represented sacrifice and his willingness to give God the best? Maybe Cain brought the rotten bananas that were left out on the counter that nobody was gonna eat anyway. And he's like, here you go, here's my offering. What, what is it? Well, we don't know, but we know that it's, it's about faith. It says, by faith, he offered the better sacrifice. And because of that faith, not because necessarily of the sacrifice itself, he's commended as righteous. God was pleased with Abel because of his, his faith in action. Now, consider this. The very act of obedience to God by faith cost Abel his life. The very offering, the sacrifice, in faith, cost Abel his life. Cain gets angry and kills his brother over the very thing that God wanted from Abel. Thus begins the lesson that Abel teaches to follow God into obedience despite the results, despite the cost. There is no prosperity gospel being preached with Abel. There is no name it and claim it. He does what please God and he's killed for it. That's the cost that he bears. That's the cost that's later borne by Jesus who for the joy set before him endures the cross. He endures the shame. That's the cost that we as his followers should be prepared to follow into for what obedience might cost us. You know this to be true because you're experiencing this faith journey right now, that life is not all roses and rainbows. He says, and yet, verse 4, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Can you hear Abel's voice tutoring you this morning? His blood cried out from the ground in testimony against Cain, but his life of faith is still speaking even in 2020 about offering obedience to God despite the cost. We praise God for the testimony of Abel. Now let's consider Enoch, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So Enoch is, a, is an Old Testament mystery because when you read in Genesis 5, you read Enoch, you see his name there. He's listed in a genealogy in Genesis 5 where it appears that the point of the whole genealogy is to show that in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, that everybody dies just as God promised. 
just as he warned, we see Adam lived 930 years and he died. Seth, 912 years and he died. Enosh, 905 and he died. Kenan, 910 and they died. And inside this list of people who died as a part of the curse from the garden, we read about Enoch who doesn't appear to die. Genesis 5, again, I'm going to just read this to you. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. What a name. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God. And remember, everyone ends, and he died, and he died, and he died. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Genesis 5, 21 through 24. So what do we learn about faith from Enoch? It says he walked with God for 300 years. This is a way of saying, that's a long time. He was 65, right? And then he walks with God after Father Methuselah for 300 years. This is a way of saying he had habitual fellowship with God. He walked with him. He knew him. He drew near to him. He pleased him. He enjoyed him. God enjoyed him. They enjoyed each other. His faith is shown as a life of devotion to God. And this life was pleasing to God so much so that God decides, you know what? I'm going to do you a solid, Enoch, and I'm going to make you skip the whole death thing. Come on. Yes, you, Enoch, come on. Come. And so we please God by drawing near to him in fellowship by faith. Now, we should not have the expectation that's going to happen for us. But we see an example here of someone who draws near to God in fellowship by faith. Now, you might be asking, how do we know this is a picture of his faith? Well, it says in verse 5, Hebrews 11, that before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. You didn't hear that in the Genesis text, did you? It's not there. But we learned that in Hebrews, that he was commended for having pleased God. And then the writer goes out of his way to show us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Ergo, he has faith. I just wanted to use the word ergo in the sermon. But he also gives two qualities of the kind of faith that pleases God, both of which Enoch had. God-pleasing faith must believe that God exists. I think that's kind of like, duh, right? Like basic. Got to believe he's, <laughs> got to believe he's real. And that he rewards. Do you see that? That he rewards those who seek him. Isn't that interesting? He rewards those who seek him. That's the kind of faith that pleases God. Remember last week we talked about reward? And that after doing God's will, at the end of chapter 10, it says, we will receive his reward. We said last week, we're not commanded to just obey without our self-interest in mind. As if, as if doing right was was the highest motivation with no self-interest. You just do your, you do your duty. That's it. Yes, we do that. Yes, we obey because it's right. That's good. But God says the kind of faith that pleases him is not the disinterested, aloof kind, but the kind that is very interested in being rewarded. In fact, it's, it's, it's vital to your faith to believe that God rewards. Does that sound strange to you? It shouldn't. You don't turn from your sins in repentance simply because it's the right thing. It is. But you turn through faith in Christ to God because you'll be forgiven for your sins. You turn not just because it's the right thing to do, the repentance, but you turn so that you'll get adopted into God's family. You'll be welcomed in as a son. You'll be welcomed in as a daughter. You turn because you'll be given an inheritance. Listen, all of these and a lot more, these are motivators. The scripture gives us reward as motivators to put your faith in Jesus. God wants to motivate you to come. He wants to motivate you to stay with him. In fact, it honors God's goodness and it honors his graciousness to recognize him as the rewarder. And what does it say about your faith if you don't believe that? What does it say about what you think about God? It actually brings dishonor to his graciousness, dishonor to his goodness if you don't have any enjoyment of, what, of who he is. No, he wants to lavish the gift of himself to you for all eternity. 
that this is one of the bedrocks of our church, treasuring Christ in all of life. And not just this life, but the life to come, to be enjoyed and treasured above all things. God wants to be the source of all of your joy. He wants to overflow the riches of his grace to you in the heavenly places now and then. If you don't believe this, if you don't believe that he exists and that he rewards you, you actually do dishonor to God. If this doesn't light up your heart, that when you come to God, he's a rewarder, he's going to give you himself, you're going to get the greatest gift in all of the world, then you really aren't believing in the true God of salvation, the God who conquers death, the God of Enoch. I love how he's, he, he's, he's pleased by his faith. God isn't impressed with your accomplishments. He isn't swooning over your achievements like a fanboy. He delights when you delight in him. When you treasure him as your reward, like Enoch did. That's what faith does. So Enoch's faith teaches us to seek the presence of God, the nearness of God, the fellowship of God. Let's consider Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world's and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. See, when we read this, I think we, we barely have enough spiritual imagination to picture it raining so hard and so long that everything is flooded away. Like we understand microbursts in Arizona, right? We, we know what it's like to have a microburst happen. That we were in a torrential downpour in April when we went to Disney World. This, this it, it just dropped buckets of water on us out of nowhere, dumped from the sky. I, I picked this picture not so much for the elephants that are playing in the water, but look at all of the rain that's coming down. It was just, just buckets of rain. and Everybody runs for cover, and anyone who wasn't wearing a poncho, you know, was like grumbling at how wet they were. But no one was fearing for their life. You know, there was shock at like, wow, like this happened in two seconds. And there's shock at sort of the relative volume, but there was a lot of laughter because our experience has taught us that rain eventually stops and everything eventually goes back to normal. But consider the context of Noah. When God told Noah it was, he was going to flood the earth, it may have been, can't prove it, it may have been that he had never seen rain before. Certainly hadn't seen rain at this level. No one had. And so there's no way he could have equated God's word with anything that seemed to make sense from his experience. But in reverent fear, he constructed the ark. He heard God. He heard his words. It was clear. May not have made a whole lot of sense. And he took those words to the bank. In reverent fear. It says it became the vehicle of salvation for those inside his household saved, those who trusted God at his word about this coming judgment, and at the same time, function as condemning the world on the outside. Anyone who mocked him for like the ridiculousness of building an ark on dry land when there's, there's no reason to do this, the seeming stupidity of building a boat in the middle of, of nowhere, and Noah's faith says, God, if you say it, I'm going to do it. The flood destroyed anyone who wasn't sheltered inside the ark. And I want you to just think about the parallel between that and the promise that we have of the coming judgment against sin, the wrath of God that is to come. And we are promised deliverance from this coming flood of judgment through the ark of Christ, the shelter of Jesus. And at the same time, we're often ridiculed, aren't, aren't we? We're often ridiculed in subtle ways. It might not be like directly to your face, but in worldviews and assumptions that people have that this life is all that there is. And so if you're living for something beyond this or if you're fearing something that's coming beyond this, you're ridiculous. But we believe it's true. We can't see it with our eyes, but we believe that God said it. And so we run into the shelter of Christ's protection from the storm. I'm asking you in this room today, have you done that? Have you run into the shelter of Christ by faith? Are you inside the ark? Are you outside the ark this morning? Noah's faith teaches us to walk in reverent fear in the coming judgment of God, knowing the way of salvation forward is through Christ and Christ alone. Verse 8, let's consider Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place 
that he was to receive as an inheritance. Hey, look, there's reward. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose design and builder is God. Abraham is called to go without knowing where he's going. God says, I'm going to give you an inheritance. And he's like, that sounds great. I'm going to go. Packs up his stuff, leaves his comfort, leaves his, his, his people, leaves his land. And his faith drives him into obedience, into the uncomfortable, into the foreign land, it says, intense. I don't know what kind of dwelling he had before, but now he's in this, this temporary tent and he's got Isaac there, his son, and Jacob, his grandson, and they're heirs with him of the same promise, and it's not yet been, been received, and he's looking forward to it. He's grabbing a hold of it by sight through the promise of faith. The way I think of this is like Abraham is like an architect who God gives him the blueprints, and he can see it. He's like, oh, yeah, I can see the building before it's even built. Oh, I can see the foundations. I can see the city that's to come. You're a master designer, God. And what he saw was truly a promised land, not tent living in Canaan, but a city, it says, who has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And that's enough for him to go. He goes, he's going without knowing. He's seen through believing. Faith is activated. He goes. That's our call today as well on our faith journey in this life because God is calling you on a journey to the high country to the heavenly places. If you listen for his voice, if you follow his call, if you endure with suffering to the very end, if you cross the finish line, you'll get there. And, and the, I think one of the things that Abraham teaches us is that if you look to what you have right now, what's right in front of you, and that's all you can see, you have your eyes too low. You have to lift up your vision to God. Lift up your gaze so that you can see not just temporary tents, but you can see immovable foundations. You can see streets of gold. You can see a throne. You can see one seated on the throne. You can see one who is ruling and reigning even right now in the chaos of this world. Abraham's faith teaches us to look to the promise of what is unseen. And then finally, fifth, Sarah. By faith, Sarah, verse 11, herself, this is Abram's wife, received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, how you like that for a description over your life, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Sarah receives this promise, right? She laughs, and there's laughter, right? Because this is not possible in normal circumstances. She, keep in mind, she's in her 90s, so not often that people in their 90s are having kids. Abraham's pushing 100. What she sees with her eyes, she's like, there's no way that this can happen. And yet, she considered him faithful who promised, right? I don't understand how this promise is working. It doesn't seem to make sense. You, I get. You, I trust. For the writer of Hebrews, faith operates in the realm of the invisible for a future that you don't yet possess, but you believe convictionally that you will because it's true based on what God's word promises. That's what he means when he says it's the assurance of things hoped for. God promised, Sarah believed, and guess what? She had a kid. Thomas Schreiner again says, faith means we put our trust in what God has promised even if those promises seem impossible to us. So five stories of faith. All of them with the basic same ending. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. I think the context here is more Abraham and Sarah, but I think it can be extended out. For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, 
they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Faith stories with the same ending. None of these heroes made it out alive. Enoch gets taken up, but none of them continue to live on this earth. And notice that none of them receive the things ultimately promised. All of them died, it says, but all of them died believing in God, believing in his promises. Not, not because they got to hold it in their hands and show it off to their friends. They died believing the promises in their minds and in their hearts. They had the substance. They had the assurance. They had the conviction that God's word is real, that his promises are true. It was so real that it was as if they could see the reality through their mind's eye, through faith, and they greet that inevitable future through faith. Hello, it's great to see you. They embrace the promise of the future. And we know this because it fundamentally changed the course of their life. We see in each one of these people's stories that it moved them into obedience. It drew them into fellowship. It calls them into a new kingdom of God, now making them strangers and exiles on this earth. And they are no different than us, friends. Just like us, through faith, they were set on a path toward the high country, toward the city of God, seeking after the joy of the true residence, the better country, heaven. The writer says if this wasn't true, they would have just gone back home. Right? So you go on a trip, think it's going to be good, you think it's going to be, you know, amazing, and then you get there and it's just, ah, it's not, I just, I want to get back home. I just want to go back home where it's comfortable, right? That's not what it says. It says they could have gone back home if that's what they were longing for. It's faith that keeps them marching forward. It's only, when you think about it, it's only faith that keeps us marching forward towards God. Right? It's only faith. We, we believe the promise and it keeps us from chucking it all and living a completely hedonistic life. Right? That's, the thing, that's what's keeping us right now from just chucking the whole gospel, throwing it in the trash, YOLO, get what you want, eat, drink, be merry, do whatever you want. The only thing that's keeping us really from doing that, social structures and conventions and laws, and faith in God. They're pulled forward into a different future because of their faith. I want you to see that your faith this morning is acting as a substance, as, 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 as something that's pulling you forward. They knew that they had on this earth what they had apart from God, and they desired a better country than the one they had. They desired a heavenly country. And listen, God will deliver on the goods. Verse 16. Therefore, it says, God is not ashamed. Therefore, because of their faith, God is not ashamed to be called their God. We often think about how we feel about God. Like, are we ashamed to be followers of Christ? Are we ashamed in a conversation with people? Are we ashamed to be identified with Jesus? We don't often think about how God feels about us. Is he ashamed of you? Is he ashamed of me? Through faith it says, God's not ashamed to be called God. For he has prepared for them a city. Now here's the beauty of this passage and then we're wrapping up. That which they saw by faith was brought to fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. From thousands of years before, this, this faith reality that they could see into the future, it's brought to, it's secured and brought to pass through the ark of God's salvation from his coming wrath through Jesus' death on the cross. Through Christ, faith in Christ, you get inside the ark. Everyone who's not in faith in Christ is outside. He comes to secure the promises that God has made. He comes to deliver us from our sins. He comes to set us on this path by faith toward the heavenly country. Jesus is the one and only yes and amen to all of God's promises. All of them are pointing to Christ. And Jesus is the one that calls us to put our faith in him again today as we make our way toward that better country. If you are seeking God by faith through Jesus, actively trusting him, then God will not be ashamed to associate himself with you. No, you have an inheritance that awaits you that's been kept by God in heaven. Nothing can touch it. 
He's preparing a place for you even now. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, John 14. Jesus is there now and he is sovereignly ruling, reigning, orchestrating, accomplishing all of God's plans over all the affairs of the world until it's brought to full completion as he intercedes for us before God so that your faith story can continue all the way to the end. So let me ask you, how is your faith story going? How's your faith story going? When, when, when people read the story of you, how is it going? Are they drawing inspiration from you? Are they drawing lessons from your life? You have a faith story just like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. You have a story of obedience, of repentance, of drawing near, of reverent fear, of going without knowing, of trusting God in the impossible. What I'm trying to impress upon you is that your life is telling a story even now. A testimony for others to look at and find encouragement. How's that going for you this morning as you look to Jesus? Maybe for some of you, it's trusting God for friendships or for companions. Maybe for some of you, it's trusting God for a season of unwanted singleness and loneliness. Maybe it's trusting God with a disability or trusting God with a sickness or trusting God with an unfulfilled longing or an unfulfilled dream. Maybe for you, it's stepping out in faith to risk something that seems really scary and you're, you, you go without knowing. Maybe for you, it's offering the sacrifice of obedience knowing that it may cost you something like Abel. Maybe it's that God wants you to draw near to him today like Enoch and with all the love that he has for you, call you to set his eyes on him again today. Maybe it's that God wants to remind you today that he's the rewarder. He's the prize that you really seek. And so my encouragement to us this morning and my application of this is look to Jesus again today and offer the sacrifice. Look to Jesus' perfect sacrifice and then offer your life the sacrifice knowing that God is calling you to something better in him. Look to Jesus knowing that God isn't limited by what seems possible. He's a God of miracles. Look to Jesus with fear and trembling, knowing that the floodwaters are coming and time is running short. Look to Jesus by faith and the promises of God. Today is the day to believe in the gospel. It will make you a stranger and an exile in this world. America is not your true home. You're being called to a better country, a lasting country, a permanent country, an immovable country with foundations laid by God himself. Faith does the soul good. God, help us as we've heard your word. And we've seen these, the revelation, we've seen the reasoning, and we've seen the examples today. Help us to be honest with ourselves of where we are with you. Lord, I pray you would convict us of where we've been walking without faith and unbelief where our lives are basically functionally atheists, where we don't seek to submit ourselves to you. And Lord, not for any other reason than just to receive the reward of your presence, Lord, to know that you're pleased with us. Lord, would you draw us near to you again today through communion? It's only by the broken body and only by the shed blood that we come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.